Greetings, everyone. Daniel's back again with Bruno Bostiles. Uh, Bruno, welcome. Um, I think everyone knows Bruno's work. Uh, he teaches at Columbia and other places. Bruno's a translator of Alain Badiou's uh, work into English and is a philosopher in his own right, written extensively on Freudian Marxism, um, contemporary issues in, in uh, Marxist thought, uh, philosophical issues, and has been um, uh, really, frankly, an inspiration to me personally. Uh, so I've really benefited a lot from your work, Bruno, and it's really an honor to sit down with you. Today, we want to examine a new work that Bruno has translated from an Argentinian psychoanalytic thinker, Leon Rosichner, called Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism. So this is one of uh, Rosichner's uh, most systematic uh, texts. Uh, although Rosichner as a thinker is most known to us for his work on St. Augustine, I think is fair to say. So Bruno, I, you know, with this translation of this new work that you've done, what do you what do you see as kind of like you know its contribution you know to freudian marxist study it seems like it's been obviously a kind of uh, overlooked maybe a uh, text can you can we start with with that and then and then I'll, we'll talk about rosichner as a little bit of his biography sure well thanks for having me um so yeah um this was and and remains sort of a key text, um, although perhaps today a little bit more forgotten still than than in previous years. Um, there are probably you know a number of reasons for why uh, Rotisnev's work has not been translated, or almost none of it has been translated, except as you met, pointed out, a few fragments from his book on Saint Augustine, um, and, and some of the writings on the return to democracy after the military dictatorship in Argentina. This book, the one on Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism, so 1972, so kind of the same um, context and, and um, movementism as, as um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus, even though um, Rotisner takes a completely different take on psychoanalysis. So rather than criticizing psychoanalysis for its familialism and so on, he basically wants to point out that Freud has um, a crucial uh, set of questions to add to anybody who wants to, to understand the functioning of power, uh, the possibility of revolt or revolution. And therefore, the left, according to him, uh, needs to study um, these mechanisms um, whereby power inscribes itself in the subject. And he believes Freud has, you know, indispensable contributions to add to, to that discussion. So very much along the line of, uh, of what already was sort of the, the um, tendency, the trend of Freud and Marxism. But we, I think, kind of a, a unique voice in it. Um, in many ways. I mean, it was a very difficult text to translate because even though it's not as though he uses, you know, um, words that are uh, too technical, um, but just grammatically and, and, and conceptually, he has a very peculiar style, um, which is in some ways kind of agrammatical in many occasions and just the sentences keep going on and on and on. Um, so I try to make sense of that. That might be one of the reasons why it has never been translated. It's also a, a very peculiar book, uh, kind of unusual in the sense that he offers an almost, not just page per page, but like sentence per sentence interpretation of three works. Um, so um, Civilization and a Discontent and Group Psychology, or what's probably better called for him in Rotisner's eyes, Mass Psychology and Analysis of the of the ego and then an introduction some comments on the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis and so that's i think that that schol scholastically seeming discussion of um, every single sentence in freud's account may not be that palatable to the theoretically oriented uh, reader in the anglo-american tradition um but i i still thought and that it's a spectacular text um, 
And so I felt that it was important to try to get this out in English translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with the um, uh, lack of jargon. It's not much technical yeah. jargon. There's not much. And he does not create neologisms. He does not go down that kind of concept invention. Like, you know, in Anti-Oedipus, we have like, I don't know, Anti-Oedipus doesn't even have a glossary of concepts, although it should. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, although theory of the subject does, uh, which is I right. think, uh, important. But Rosichner is kind of doing a kind of exegetical work in a way, but the results of that are uh, shocking. And I want to get to what's shocking about them in a moment. But can you give us a brief snapshot of the of his biography of, you know, wrote it in 72. He flees Peron, the Peron uh, uh, government. And um, what was his sort of status within South American militant scene? Yeah, so you know, he was fleeing the, the military dictatorship um, you know, that began with the coup in, on, in March 1976. So not, not the Peronista um, government with which he polemicized later on. And so um, he was trained in, in Paris like many uh, Latin American intellectuals. He studied with uh, Merleau-Ponty and Lucien Gautman. Um, he wrote his dissertation in Paris on um, which something that might seem strange today, but it's a polemic with uh, Max Scheler. So Scheler was um, a phenomenologist, very important, more important perhaps in Latin America than in other parts of the world. Uh, he's also been com almost completely forgotten today. Um, he still, I think, is worth reading his text on on um, shame and the feeling of of um, uh, of shame or or modesty, pudeur. Um, that was very influential for somebody like Lacan. But or in he, Argentina, it was it, were, on, it was uh, actually resentment too is quite interesting. And there, also the book on on resentment. Um, but in Argentina, it was actually the military, the right wing military, who were reading Sailor from kind of a Christian personalist perspective. And so um, Rotesner already starts out by offering kind of a, a scathing critique of the so-called materialism of a phenomenology that is capable of talking about affects. I mean, so this is, I, I think, like late 60s, uh, or, or, sorry, early 60s that he publishes his, um, his, his, his thesis um persona y comunidad so personhood and community um in a sense it's sort of a critique of what we now would call the affective turn avant la lettre because already there he says look all these phenomenologists they're happy to talk about affects and bodily fluids and 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 emotions and the political life of emotions and so on but that's as far as they really go uh, politically they are and they remain reactionary idealists um, and the military in Argentina, according to him, understood that better than many of the European followers of Shaler. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an inkling of, of what the kind of thinker that he is, always polemical, always going against the grain, always on the attack, sometimes even at home in them. Um, he was uh, ex extremely important uh, for a text that was published in 1966, um, in a Argentinian leftist uh, journal called La Rosa Blindada. Um, and the text itself was called La Izquierda Sin Sujeto, the left without a subject. And so that basically is sort of the platform or almost like a manifesto type intervention in which he said, look, if the left, the traditional sort of Marxist left, continues to talk only about the critique of political economy and the so-called objective factors, or conditions for political struggle and forgets or ignores the subjective side of this question, then there will never be any progress made on the left, let alone the revolutionary front. And so that was a very polemical text. It was inscribed within the sway sort of, of a, a post-Cuban revolution, post-1959 enthusiasm. He went to Cuba, um, he worked closely um, with um, intellectuals and artists uh, uh, that who were part of the Cuban Revolution, including Tomas Gutierrez Alea, the famous filmmaker, 
who actually based probably his most famous movie, Memories of Subdesarrollo, Memories of uh, Underdevelopment, on a text um, that um, Rotisner wrote in the aftermath of the um, the victory from the Cuban perspective of Playa Giro, uh, Gijón, um, where the Contras try to invade Cuba and, and assassinate Castro. They um, obviously failed. Um, most of the Contras were arrested and put on trial, or rather they were given hearings. And these hearings were published and uh, Rotisner does some kind of a discourse analysis, again, before the term was even used by anybody on the, in political theory, a discourse analysis of the kind of justifications that the, the counter-revolutionaries give for what they were doing or for why they were not guilty. And so I write about this a little bit in the chapter on one of the two chapters on Rotisner and the book on Marx and Freud in Latin America. But he gives, uh, Rotisner gives this kind of a typology of, you know, the priest or the, um, the mercenary assassin or the intellectual or the petty bourgeois student or the, um, uh, the bystander. All of them come up with different arguments. Oh, it wasn't my fault. I was just following orders or... I was doing the good thing, but I, I didn't want to do that. And, and so Rochester concludes from this that there was no integration, no articulation between individual responsibility and the collective. And that's what he calls sort of a logic of bourgeois morality, where there's sort of a disconnect. Uh, everything turns around uh, purification of individual motives or, or excuses um, that fail to take responsibility for sort of... Um, intersubjective or uh, Rotisner prefers to talk about an intercorporeal uh, collective responsibility. And that's in a sense the kind of dialectic that he's been trying to define or understand and articulate throughout his writings. And so the book on Freud and Limits of Bourgeois Individualism is the most systematic theoretical attempt to develop that dialectic, a dialectic between the, both the psychic and the political or between political economy and libidinal economy, to use the terms that Lyotard and Deleuze and Guattari would, would, would adopt on the other side of the Atlantic, um, or between the individual and the, and the collective. Um, hmm. And so it's not so much trying to find the complementarity between Freud and Marx, sort of saying, oh, what Marx failed to offer, you can find in Freud, and then what Freud failed to offer, you find in Marx, you put the two together, and voila, you have uh, you know, a beautiful synthesis of Freud and Marxism, but rather um, taking seriously the, the gaps and internal divisions and scissions of, of their thoughts mm -hmm. and, and looking at how through those sort of internal um, tensions, they are actually uh, presupposing uh, uh, a combined logic. Mm -hmm. or, or, the, or what I call a, a you know, a historical theory of the subject. Yeah. Um, and that's what he's trying to do in, in, yeah. in the book with this close analysis. It's still in the back of his mind. There's two other sort of uh, more specific local concerns that uh, guide him. One is uh, an attempt to study to what extent uh, Peron could be uh, an example of a leftist political leader. Um, it, he doesn't say this publicly or openly, um, but you can kind of conclude, I think, or infer from what he writes that Peron, for him, as he would later confirm in a two-volume study of, uh, again, sort of discourse analysis of Peron's uh, political speeches, that Peron remains kind of an example of a bourgeois leader. Uh, which is a concept that he develops based on Freud's group psychology and analysis yeah. of the ego. Uh, whereas Che Guevara, um, who had been killed, of course, uh, in Bolivia, uh, by the time Rotisner finished uh, Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism, emerges at least once or twice towards the end of the book as an example of a revolutionary kind of leadership. <laughs> Great. And one of the striking claims of the Freud and the limits of bourgeois individualism is that Freud overturned bourgeois social science of his time in his group psychology. And so Rosicner tries to show that 
if you take like someone like Gustave Le Bon, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote about and was concerned with group psychology and precisely, but he was concerned about group psychology precisely in an effort to kind of tame the unruly uh, masses in revolt, right? So that whole like late 19th century um, fascination with the herd. And, um, and of course he says that Freud would um, use the concept of horde Right. But um, could you I want to invite you to say a little bit more about this kind of overarching claim that if we read the text of Freud's social writings and group psychology to the letter, what we find is an undeniable theorization on Freud's own terms. You don't need to kind of supplement it, per se, with a theorization of the revolutionary subject. And then, of course, he says, well, you know, Freud kind of was an ostracized Jewish scientist, this is part of the reason why this is not so evident, maybe, when we read Freud. And of course, if you were to talk to, uh, you know, conservative psychoanalysts today, they would reject the presupposition, I imagine, that, you know, Freud is some revolutionary in disguise. <laughs> um, I'm sure many Lacanians would reject that claim, right? Um, and we know Freud as a liberal, right? right? So this to me is like a, a revelation or a kind of light bulb, you know, for, for, for somebody who's a Marxist that's coming at psychoanalysis, you always wonder, like, is psychoanalysis actually a bourgeois thing? Yeah. You know, Rosichner really gives a strong rebuttal. What do you, what do you make of that? Yeah. I mean, I think this is, um, probably the, yeah, you know, one of the bold claims in the book, uh, particularly, you know, at the beginning of the, the part, the second part where he studies group psychology and analysis of the ego. And he, uh, Rotisner, uh, in a sense, restores um, the context and the text from uh, Gustave Le Bon's interpretation of mass or group, or maybe, you know, mob psychology. Um, in, it, in all its sort of reactionary glory and says, why does, why does uh, Freud not talk about Le Bon's political orientation? Why does Freud not say anything about the fact that Le Bon, with, together with so many other uh, so-called group psychologists, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, use this as a kind of a, a proto-fascist uh, rebuttal of um, the lowering of our intellectual capacities as part of sort of mass con contamination or contagion, um, that we go back to sort of a, a hurt mentality. All of this would be to, to sort of decry and lambast the uh, lowly intellectual capacities of the masses. And Rotisner um, argues, look, when Freud also highlights in Le Bon the capacity that um, humanity is capable of higher moral insights when it thinks at the level of collective responsibility, then um, we need to draw the conclusion that he's going directly against Le Bon's reactionary politics. But he, since he doesn't say anything about Le Bon's politics, um, Rotisner feels the need to sort of first, you know, reestablish that context and then say, look, by being silent about that, it's not that Freud is, is um, quietly supporting this critique of um, the animalistic um, mob mentality that's attributed to the political power of the masses, uh, but the total opposite, that he's in a sense thinking about um, the possibility of spontaneous and even revolutionary collective movements that are capable of reaching the highest level of, uh, of, of morality or, or rather ethics. Um, and to say that, or to suggest that he can use for its own words, you know, at that point, once he has gone so, sort of through the movement of, of showing what it is that Freud does not mention about Le Bon. And most people who, you know, talk about, about that uh, book don't really delve into this, right? So they just focus on, let's say, something that would be comparable to what um, Althusser was doing at the same time with his essay on uh, uh, ideological state apparatuses, namely church and army, 
what, what Freud calls two artificial groups. And so uh, Rosenstein insists, look, um, the two pillars of so-called modern democracy, um, the army and the church, the Christian church, um, are here called artificial groups, which Freud distinguishes from sp spontaneous masses. Couldn't we think about what those spontaneous masses would mean? And, and at what point can these spontaneous masses turn into revolutionary masses? And can we understand the mechanisms, whether it's identification or panic and so on, that are put in place uh, through these logics of sort of collective ensembles, right? Um, so for all those reasons, Rosisner suggests that Freud is actually um, not more revolutionary than, not only more revolutionary than we think, but maybe more revolutionary than Freud himself thought he was at the time. Yeah, it kind of tracks with this wonderful intervention of Etienne Balibar in um, his work you may be familiar with called The Invention of the Superego, where mm -hmm. he says something in, kind of similar, which is, you know, Freud had these polemics in his debates with um, liberal jurist Kelsen, and uh, this was around the time when Freud invented his concept of the superego, in part, Balibar shows, because Freud's group psychology was being accused, okay, of being basically a justification of dictatorship of proletariat. Hmm? <laughs> so that's a beautiful point. And because there's a kind of anti-Semitic component there and an yeah. anti-Bolshevik component there. So you kind of, the bourgeois social science of the time was saying, wait a second, this new emerging scientific practice of psychoanalysis is antinomian ultimately it has a kind of antinomian foundation and this guy kelson was forcing freud to come up with a theory of the law in a, in a certain way so kind of related to that i uh, wanted to ask you also what you think about you know this notion of how rosichner theorizes things like uh aggressiveness of the bourgeois class and and also thinks about the repertoire of Freudian concepts from uh, the creation of ideals, the theory of ideals, ideal ego, ego ideal, as well as even death drive in this kind of imminent way to the mode of production. Everything, everything is kind of imminent to the capitalist social production system itself. And that in that way, the text feels very close to Deleuze and Guattari, right? In this kind of materialist analysis. And even I think he says at some point, you know, we shouldn't read beyond the pleasure principle as a kind of overture to a reductive biological conception of this sadistic drive, right? That it's much better to think about the aggressive drive as permeating from the system of production and so on and so on. So I guess my question is, talk a little bit about how he reads all the Freudian key ideas and concepts through this kind of, you know, productive material logic, I, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm still not 100% clear about this, um, you know, even after translating the book, right? which is in part because for, uh, Rochesner doesn't really talk much about the death drive. Right? Um, this is not just a question of translation. Like um, I use instincts because I, I stuck to the sort of standard edition also because Rochesner himself does that. So it's mostly instintos. Um, even though today after Lacan and Zizek, of course, most people would talk about the death drive, not right. the death instinct. Uh, for, uh, Rotisner actually talks more about angustia de muerte, like sort of the anxiety of death, or even more plainly, the fear of death. Um, again, th maybe this has something to do with the fact that he's not falling for uh, for sort of technical jargon. I also think it means that he's not really that interested in trying to set or define or stipulate uh, a technological or technical vocabulary mm -hmm. to talk about psychoanalysis. Um, and he's kind of in the middle, not as a as a nice synthesis, but 
neither on the side of the Luz and Guattari, nor on the side of, let's say, the contemporary Lacanians. In what sense? I think that he's trying to understand how um, power under capitalism is able to inscribe itself within our psyche or within our subjectivity. And so his key argument is this rep repeated claim that the subject is the nucleo, the, the kernel of the verification of history. So history unfolds within the subject understood, obviously not as an individual subject, but as a collective subject. Uh, because of sort of the psychic processes of separation, um, infancy, um, integration into the law, into the family, even, you know, questions about castration and so on in the more technical sense, there was always a temptation, sort of a narcissistic temptation to go back to the warm uh, imaginary space of uh, fusion with the mother. Uh, again, not in a biological sense, but in an ideological sense, um, which is only sort of a, a, a fake or a false exit from the real struggle or the real contradictions. This is a way in, in which Freud, uh, sorry, Rotisner kind of suggests that there are mechanisms of what we, you know, what traditionally is called internalization, um, which has to do with the inscription of uh, and the, through, you know, the interjection of guilt, and uh, he goes back to the, uh, the the scenario of the killing of the primordial father, claims that this plays out at the level of both, uh, you know, phylogenetically and ontogenetically, so both at the level of, say, humanity as a species and at the level of each individual subject that needs to go through similar processes and struggles or transactions. Um, but... Unlike Deleuze and Guattari, um, Rotisner, even though this might be a point of contention among different readers of Rotisner, but in my reading at least, he does not presuppose some kind of a, you know, a, a positivity of the desiring machine that would be co-opted or absorbed or subsumed within the different machines for, you know, re-territorializing our desires and capturing our desires by state apparatuses or ideological apparatuses. Um, there is no such notion of kind of a prior um, positive or uh, understanding of desire without lack um, as, a, as though that were sufficient to counter particularly the Lacanian version of psychoanalysis where, where desire is based on the impossibility of a, of a lack. And so that's where I would say he's separating himself from the layers of Guattari, even though I still think it would be a very productive exercise to connect the way in which Rochester argues that this whole scientific myth of the killing of the primordial father and sort of this proto or pseudo anthropological theory that Freud starts in Totem and Taboo about the primitive horde and the primordial father and so on, that the, as a scientific myth, and that's to say as a retroactive conjecture that we need in order to understand the contemporary, uh, the contradictions of the present, that this would be exactly similar or homologous to what Marx does in his arguments in the Grundriss about, uh, starting in the Grundriss about originary or primitive accumulation, right? This is sort of the, the bloody origins that we need to posit mm. as, a, as a hypothetical sort of retroactive logic without which we cannot fully criticize our present. Mm -hmm. But he does not do that in the way that the Lacanians today would do, which is um, roughly to suggest um, that the death drive is, is precisely that which um, capitalism fails to recognize. And there, instead of having kind of a positive unconscious, as Foucault also says at one point in uh, the English uh, preface to the, 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 the Order of Things, you know, this notion of a, of a positive unconscious, like a, an unconscious not defined by negation or by lack. Um, Brotisner doesn't adopt that notion of a positive 
uh, unconscious, nor does he choose the side of, you know, a, a sort of leftist politics based on an acknowledgement because it can never be anything more than a, an acknowledgement and an attempt to find the modus vivendi, as Zizek says, I believe, in the, in the uh, beginning of um, the sublime object of ideology with the death drive, that this would be the fundamental kernel of the real. That's not the argument that uh, Rotisner uh, gets from Freud, probably, or might be one of the reasons why, uh, um, as you probably will have noticed throughout Freud and the limits of bourgeois individualism, there's sort of two silent interlocutors with whom he's polemicizing. One is Althusser and the Althusserians, including the Althusserians in, in Latin America, who are maybe even more important than the Althusserians in Europe, and two, Lacan, um, who I don't think is mentioned even once. No. Um, Althusser may be is quoted once, mm -hmm. um, but he's also alluded to a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, when he talks about like theoretical practice or the, the, the fashion of looking for a scientific point of view as opposed to an ideological point of view, or when he even suggests uh, ideas about the uh, ideological state apparatuses essay where in a sense, the subject becomes nothing more than a bearer or a placeholder of, a, of an empty place within a, within a structure, which, according to Rotisner, evacuates uh, precisely the dimension of struggle and contradiction that he wants to restore to that mm -hmm. moment of the inscription of individuals in um, capitalist society. Yeah, in a way, I want to return to how you see the Althusserian... Uh, silent uh, debate going, but I was, I was drawn also to what he says a bit about um, familialism, because like you said, it's not the same kind of libertine anti-familialism that we see in Deleuze and Guattari and so on. It's a different thing. I mean, in a way, the revolutionary group for Rosichner circumvents, or maybe you could say has some kind of rupture with the bourgeois familial superego. And I was drawn to that idea in a certain way. It struck me as as quite um quite interesting way to think about it and in part that is the case because the revolutionary group uh has you could say a certain proximity to the real of the of the productive system right which which the bourgeois familial superego shelters us from right shelters us from in the status of what you might call an artificial group because the function of an artificial group is to preserve that kind of um, fusion with the mother, you know, to preserve that kind of narcissistic um, thing. But of course, its contradiction, its contradictory appearance is one of aggressivity, right? So the social field is, is, is an aggressive one. And so in a way, the proletarian, because he's thinking it along class lines, in a sense, proletarian revolutionary group has a has a break from that. Yeah. And uh, but it's a different theory of break. It's a different theory of rupture than we are familiar with from the Lacanian theory of rupture. Do you, do you do you agree with that? How would you how would you parse that out? I'm still trying to work it out myself. Well, um, let me return the question to you. How would you define uh, the Lacanian view of a break or a rupture? What form yeah. would that take? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a good question. Um, maybe this is kind of uh, ambiguous for me right now. I mean, I think. In Deleuze and Guattari, it's obviously quite different than it would look in, say, Badiou, right? Um, I think that's another interesting thing. Obviously, uh, Badiou and Rosichner have no communication with one another. But perhaps one could uh, identify quite a lot of overlap with not the later Badiou, but the early Badiou of theory of the subject, which, of course, you translated and that was definitely a question i wanted to raise with you because i think in there the logic is a different logic of um scission it's it's much more dialectical um i'm not sure what uh that you would say on the question of familialism per se i'm not exactly sure but i mean um i i'm not, I'm, I'm not confident that i can give you a clear sense of this in part because i think the Lacanian field is quite heterogeneous on the on the question, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I guess I guess you could say the question that Lacan let me let me try to answer it. Then would be that 
um, Lacan thinks at a certain stage in his thought, the social bond vis-a-vis -a, -vis a theory of discourses and that each one provides what he calls a social link. So uh, the modern period is dominated by what he calls university discourse. And that throws the whole notion of social bond into a crisis and so on. So part of the, maybe part of the problem you could say is that Lacan doesn't have a clear theory other than some vague notion, which is around the discourse of the analyst and someone like Zizek would try to say, well, we can think about Lenin's revolutionary subject in concert or in dialogue with Lacan's uh, discourse of the analyst, let's say. But ultimately, I'm not sure that those um, uh, efforts have been fruitful or as conclusive as Rosa Schneer's. Rosa Schneer's is a much more uh, clear uh, solution, maybe. That's why I'm drawn to it, uh, you know? I, I know that's not exactly adequate, but I, I would throw it back to you. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, of course, just as there's different schools in 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 Freudianism, there's different schools in Lacanianism, um, and without you know trying to reduce them all to one sort of caricature, one uh, conclusion that you know some theorists would draw is that uh, there are moments of rupture that are kind of um, crises that um, uh, put into relief. Um, the fact that the social bond is kind of based or grounded in um, a, a, a disavowal or a peculiar relation to the death drive. And so um, very often, I think, in the analysis of concrete situations or historical events, um, if it's not uh, done through popular culture, literature, or film, which then stand in as illustrations of moments of the, the appearance, the apparition of the real, um, or of the almost like you know, Stephen King-like um, uh, uh, appearances or aesthetic, uh, perfect aesthetic illustrations of the id-like nature of, of the death drive, um, if that's the notion that we get of the real, um, it has very little to say about what Rotisner calls the actual um, logic of, of rebellion, of, of struggle, of contradiction, of uh, transaction. So the reason why he always goes back to this moment of, um, you know, the fraternal alliance and uh, and the killing of the primordial father is not just to understand the uh, origin of the superego from the guilt that the the brothers feel over killing the father and then, you know, feeling in a sense more uh, guilty and oppressed by uh, um, the image of, of the father after the killing than before. Um, Freud um, and Rotisner draws a conclusion from this, look, moral conscience has its origin in a violent act of killing, which was a collective act of rebellion. And he draws the broader conclusion from this to suggest at the origin of all morality, at the, law, at the origin of all subjectivity and conscious, conciencia in Spanish meaning both consciousness and moral conscience, is rebellion. So for, if for Freud at the beginning was the act, for Rotisner at the beginning there was rebellion. And he wants to restore that moment of rebellion and say, look, everything has to do with what we do with that rebellion. Mm -hmm. There's different uh, ideological uh, patterns and structures that have managed to um, mobilize those logics in a certain way, as you were saying before, to shelter us, both in the, in the tra traditional sort of nuclear family, as what you might call an ideological state apparatus, or as what we call it, an artificial group but also in, in, in the different institutions of the three monotheistic religions of the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This uh, it in turn explains why Rotisner, uh, shortly after writing on Freud and on Peron, started to be so keenly interested in writing about Augustine and understanding the difference between what he calls the three Oedipuses, the Greek, the Jewish, and the Christian Oedipus, and that they uh, obey different logics of subjectivization and subjection, um, but working within those same parameters to understand the social logic on the basis of a fundamental struggle. 
there's always a struggle. There's not a pure, angelical, innocent child that is uh, subsequently molded by the big oppressive machine of capitalism, the family, or psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. as, let's say, a more uh, libertarian interpretation of Freud and schizoanalysis would hold. Um, but it's also not simply a question of recognizing or acknowledging the death drive that is constantly being disavowed and, and keeps on producing mm. and reproducing mm. all the discontent of modern civilization as some of the Lacanian interpretations of Freud would hold. Yeah. That's, I think, where he's located. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very helpful because he says we axiomatically must look at Freud's uh, production of his social writings, his group psychology, from the position not of the neurotic, but from the position of what? Of normality. Norm, of yeah. normality and normality is a condition which is what he says sick with reality i love that phrase and he says uh, that there are kind of generally three uh, subverters of normality yeah the artist the neurotic and the rebel and um uh, but for you could say maybe rosa Schneer says there's a there's a fourth right which is the revolutionary and that this is actually like uh the, the 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 direction which is pushing us the farthest away and of course he makes this great reference which is kind of an homage to the power of religion as maybe like that artificial group which is the most successful in the preservation of the um the maternal fusion uh, so it's no surprise that he would be drawn to an analysis of religion at a later uh, time at the same time i'm wondering like you know um the theory of the revolt of the revolutionary group is what he calls the fraternal bond. It's like a fraternal fr a fraternity. It's kind of a beautiful idea, which made me frankly think of um, the fused group when Sartre's work, right? I wonder sure. if you uh, saw that, right? Because, you know, in Sartre's analysis of French revolution of Jacobins, that's precisely what's going on. And for Sartre, the issue there was that they create a kind of um, sort of sort of bond which which uh, doesn't doesn't last it, it cannot sustain itself right and i wonder if rosa Chner has that same question and you see this in Badju as well of course this notion of Badju's ethics of fidelity and so on like do you how, how does how does a, a revolutionary group sustain itself for rosa Chner? does he does he theorize that problem um at all as I, I didn't see it there, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, no, it's not It's not there in the, the Freud book. Um, it's not developed. I mean, if you want to compare it to theory of the subject, but use theory of the subject, um, at, at the point of uh, theory of the subject, but you is still proposing the party as the structure um, to give shape to that, to that like uh, organized fidelity, uh, which he would soon thereafter abandon, like starting in 1985, like in, uh, can politics be thought to some extent? He, cl he claims it needs political organization. So the organization then is just called political organization. Um, you could still ask the question in what sense is it different from the argument before about the party form? Um, if now, we have under a different name something that previously was called, you know, a, a need for a party structure. There's nothing comparable in in Rotisner. And after the Freud book, he sort of goes off in a different direction. Um, he has, of course, many uh, conjunctural interventions um, after the, well, during the military dictatorships, towards the end of the dictatorship. He argues um, very strongly and polemically against a certain left um, that included Jose Arico, probably one of the foremost Latin American Marxists and specialists and editors of uh, sort of a Gramscian understanding of Marxism. Many of those Gramscian intellectuals started to argue in favor of uh, finding a new social pact after the military coup. Uh, they became... Uh, public intellectuals in support of the Alfonsine government, the first democratically elected uh, government, uh, all in the name of kind of a new hegemonic pact, mm. um, which 
Roti Snare completely rejected, again, as a form of sheltering us from facing and confronting the reality, which is that at most this is a truce, a tregua, that should not hide the fact that we're still within a civil war. Um, and this was being obliterated by somehow believing that there was a before and an after of the military dictatorship and that we were going to move from civil war and uh, or a dirty civil war towards kind of a democratic pact. Mm. Um, he was adamantly opposed to those leftists who uh, supported the military regime in the war of the Falcon Islands uh, or Las Malvinas wrote a little book uh, that was not liked by anybody, which is called From the Dirty War to the Clean War, because he believed that all those leftist arguments for in favor of national sovereignty were uh, literally uh, supporting the military in trying to whitewash um, the, the dictatorship and somehow appropriate leftist uh, signifiers, as we would say today, such as national uh, popular sovereignty uh, for what was and, and could only be considered a reactionary attempt to which no socialist and no leftist should ever uh, lend its, his, their support, according to Rotisner. So after the military uh, dictatorship and during the transition in, to democracy, he kept on intervening polemically in, in many of these debates, in a sense, always going against the established consensus at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, including, for example, um, when uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a one time Marxist and then mostly Heideggerian uh, philosopher, Oscar del Barco, wrote a, a short letter uh, to a, a journal uh, in, in Cordoba, in Argentina, which was later sort of rebaptized. Uh, no mataras, thou shalt not kill, which is just a letter to the editor in which they had published a, uh, a, an interview and a reportage on uh, a Guevarist guerrilla group that had uh, executed two of their own um, young Jewish militants. So there was a, definitely an element of anti-Semitism involved in this. Uh, they were executed because the leader... Uh, perceived that there was a threat of, of a psychotic breakdown on the part of those two militants and they wanted to avoid this. Um, they were basically almost starving to death in, um, in the region around Salta um, in Argentina in the mountains. And Oscar del Barco writes this letter saying, look, we're all guilty. Uh, the fact that I was in support of this uh, uh, Guevarist guerrilla group gave them logistical support at the time. Um, makes me guilty as well, and we should all accept our guilt. Uh, we should adopt the sort of Christian Levinasian uh, categorical imperative, thou shalt not kill, and uh, there is no way we can justify legitimate violence on the side of the left any more than on the right. Mm. Rotisner there again intervened very polemically by saying, look, we can't just uh, equivocate on, on uh, all violence is the same. Um, there are different kinds of violence. So you see, while he was against revolutionary violence in the 1970s, when he had a, a militarized or uh, armed left Peronismo in Argentina, he kind of went against the consensus of nonviolence in the 1980s and, and uh, until the early 2000s. And so questions about how can you organize the left are, uh, are look a little bit like, you know, um, academic scholastic debates when you're trying to deal with the forms that the democratic governments will take, the interventions that leftist intellectuals will make in, in the context both of the end of the dictatorship at the beginning of the de transition to the democracy, or the whole uh, public debate, this, this led to more than a thousand pages of public uh, polemics with everybody basically throwing in their weight in, for, in favor or against Oscar del Barco's uh, claim that we needed to sort of accept guilt for uh, the moment of revolutionary violence uh, as partly responsible for the coup. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, and in that context, Rotisner wasn't talking about 
you know, what ideal form should mm. Marx, Marx's right. uh, our Leninist politics take in the way that but you or um, or Zizek were doing around the same time. Nonetheless, his writings, which had always been influential for um, in uh, younger intellectuals, both in late sixties, early seventies, many of whom learned their Freud or their Marx through either clandestine seminars with Rotisner or his books. Um, but m most of his books, you know, fell on, you know, complete silence. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he always complained about that, that even when he was uh, diametrically going against the, 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 the consensus at the time, um, there's until sort of a new renaissance of interest in Rotisner, to which I, I've, you know, tried to contribute my little bit. Um, there were maybe two articles um, on Rotisner's thinking in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For somebody who, who had put such a heavy and, and major stamp on, on the way people thought about political subjectivity in Argentina, um, how to understand the dictatorship, how to understand um, exile, how to understand return to democracy. Um, the fact that this led to no public debate whatsoever to him was really stunning. Mm. You said that he um, has this kind of uh, quiet polemic with the Althusserian orientation. And of course, uh, it would be interesting, I'm sure, I don't know if they had uh, debates, but Laclau emerges as a thinker who would be like literally a diametric opposition to <laughs> Rosichner, I would assume. Um, you also mentioned that he does his own kind of discourse analysis, but obviously, after reading the book, uh, there's no way that his discourse analysis is similar to the Althusserian way of looking at discourse. I know like um, you've pointed this out, I think in um, some of your work on Althusser, that Lacan, Lacan's theory of the discourses actually really began with Althusser when Althusser brought him in to yeah. uh, give him space to teach, right? Right. The seminars. Um, so Rosichner is aware of the discourse turn, right? But he rejects yeah. it. He re yeah, is that right? So but nonetheless, he still uses it in some ways. Could you talk a little bit about the Althusser and maybe the discourse dimension here? Yeah, I mean, there's something strange going on, um, which is that he is quietly, but also in other texts, vociferously opposed to Althusser's orientation and the Althusserians who were quite important and successful in Argentina, and from which obviously Laclau himself emerges. Um, it would be interesting, or it would have been interesting to find out. Um, I don't think uh, Rotisner is ever quoted in Laclau's work. Um, I also don't think Laclau ever quotes Badiou. I have no, my no. suspicion. No, 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 though. no, no, no. You, you, you remember the, um, the, um, the collection. I mean, yeah, like oh, after, after, like um, when Badiou became you know, famous and, uh -huh. and so, uh, yeah. yes, yeah. of course, uh, he wrote that, that, has a few one. articles on, right. yes. Um, but I mean, like at the time when Laclau was trying to develop his own thinking, for example, right. in the, the early 1970s book on uh, the Marxist reading of populism and, and Peronismo, um, or even a Gemini and socialist strategy, which you would assume having come out, what is it, 1984, 85, uh, would at least have some awareness of Badiou's theory of the subject or older texts like his book on the l'ideologie or Théorie de la Contradiction. Now, those texts were, and this is very often forgotten, because it's sort of a weird chiasmic missed encounter where by going to England, to Essex, Laclau, to many international readers, loses the connection with Argentina, even though all of his thinking is, in a sense, a continued reflection on the logic of Peronismo. And conversely, once 
Laclau is in Essex and more in that Anglo-American context where he becomes, you know, in a sense, the major exponent of a way of thinking that was more widespread in Latin America than just Laclau. Um, he, the, he's also no longer read by many uh, intellectuals like Rotisner, I think. Uh, it's too late now to ask both of them about that. Um, there were certainly figures who were close to both, who rem like both to, to, close to both Laclau and Rotisner, who remained intimate friends. So they definitely had a lot of mutual friends. Um, but regardless of sort of the personal politics or the personal friendships, what I'm particularly interested in is that if if we are able to look beyond the technical jargon and the theoretical affiliations of the isms which I think is something very hard to do once you're in the Lacanian uh, atmosphere, then it should be possible to look beyond the direct polemics that oppose what is near to Althusser and Lacan and perceive a common agenda or a common set of interests and goals. That's what I try to suggest a little bit in the introduction, uh, the translator's introduction to the book on Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism, which is that even though Rotisner does not talk about Lacan, and I'm not sure, maybe a Lacanian will offer us a insightful or scathing critique of, of all of Rotisner's thinking on Freud, if they, if the Lacanians were to, you know, engage with Rotisner's thinking. But looking beyond the open polemics or the rejection of sort of certain fashions that Rotisner didn't want to go along with, even though he was reading them, they're still publishing some of the uh, manuscripts and unfinished um, papers that he had on his desk. Um, and so when you look at that, you can see he was certainly keeping up with the intellectual production coming from France, for example. Um, but he did not sort of enter into that vocabulary or into that language, not even to polemicize with it. But my wager is that what Rotisner is trying to do, starting in a book like Freud and the Limits of Bourgeois Individualism, or even that early text from 1966 on the left without a subject, is extremely close and offers a number of parallelisms with Badiou's ongoing work throughout the 70s that culminates in theory of the subject, which in turn, as you know, I consider to be the crucial entry point into Badiou's thinking in general, without which we really lose what, for, according to me, is the main impetus behind Badiou's thinking, which is not so much about the ontology of multiplicity, uh, he may disagree with this, but rather about the actual thinking of the event closer to the ground of the different, you know, conditions where, where events take place. And so that's sort of my general impression. That's why I, you know, try to be maybe a little bit more ecumenical. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also why I think it's important to not get trapped in some of the jargon mm -hmm. that immediately sort of draws you into somebody's system. That includes also Badiou's own system. Mm. I think it's very difficult to avoid getting drawn into um, a philosophical system. Yes. In fact, I think this is true for all philosophical systems. Yeah. Once they turn yeah. into systems, the people that do not allow their thought to be turned into a system, and there's very few of them, um, I would think, for example, about Rancière, um, do not present that, that, that risk or that threat. Hmm. But there's sort of two ways of, of, of entering or engaging with a, philosoph with a philosopher or with a, a thinker. So sort of more centrifugal and centripetal tendencies. And I think once you're dealing with a professional philosopher, somebody who openly declares themselves to be philosophers, um, it's very hard to avoid the, te mm. the, 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 the almost the, the tendency, the um, somewhat narcissistic tendency of focusing inward on mm. the internal logic and concepts of one's own system. Mm -hmm which no longer produces any, any uh, creative thought whatsoever about the logics of, and, and situations that are actually before us. Mm -hmm. Rather than it, it just becomes a question about pure exegesis of 
and the correct reading of, of a certain text. Now, I think all of that, of course, is extremely important and we should work our way through whatever text we are picking out as some, something that speaks to us. But only uh, for me, from my point of view, and this is why I have no uh, wish or uh, propensity to you know, speak of myself as a philosopher, only in, in the sense that it becomes kind of a toolbox for thinking in concrete situations. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. I think, what, even though he's, Rotisner is presenting a, a textual exegesis of page after page of these uh, two major works by Freud, it goes well beyond mm -hmm. you know, a scholastic interpretation of Freud. He's constantly like moving back and forth between what does this tell us to understand what is going on today? For example, what can we learn from Freud, from the Freud and the limits of bourgeois individualism about the contemporary conjunction mm -hmm. between white supremacy and Christian fundamentalism mm -hmm. in this country, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is that? Mm -hmm. And this is why it is so incredibly prescient on his part that he says we need to go back in order to understand how capitalism is even possible. It's not just like. In, in the way Max Weber or, uh, proposed that Protestantism is the, and Marx himself yes. said in some of the fragments, Protestantism is the ideal religion for capitalism. Mm. Rotisner's claim in the book on St. Augustine goes way beyond that and says, capitalism would not be possible without the prior production of a certain logic of subjectivity for which we find the fundamental manual in the Confessions by Augustine. Mm. And the way he subjected himself both to the Roman, Christian Roman Empire Mm -hmm. And to Christianity as as a monotheistic, you know, imperial world religion, mm -hmm. that should give us an inclination and 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 an understanding mm -hmm. of what we see today. Again, in times similarly of collapse and decadence and yeah. complete disarray. Yeah, it'd be interesting to put into dialogue his work on Augustine with Pierre Klosowski, the Nietzschean French scholar who developed so much um, of a kind of and Leotard also has so much to say on Augustine's influence on Western subjectivity and the phantasm and these kinds of things that develop from that. Uh, but I think you're right. He says, you know, um, on the Christian fundamentalism and white supremacy thing, he says, yeah, like, you know, the normal subject of capitalism is the one in which repression has triumphed. And then, you know, from that, you can see that the Lacanian view on repression complicates things so much because on the one hand they want to say something like the social link in the capitalist discourse that we live in is like post prohibitory so like we need a better way to repress mm -hmm. whereas Rosichner is much more on the side of a kind of liberatory uh working through repression so there's a difference there that i i think you're right i did not read this from the lens of a dogmatic lacanianism i read it you know on its own terms and i um I really found it. This is why I wanted to have you come on because I really did find it so refreshing. Um, and I wanted to actually switch to theory of the subject. I mean, theory of the subject, okay, has a lot to say about the pitfalls of Lacanianism as a kind of bourgeois approach. You know, that I love that point he makes, Bedju makes it. Ord ordinary happiness is enough. Well, yeah. he says for the militant, ordinary happiness is not enough. Right. So there's like these these uh, these limits, actually, in the in a sense, like Lacanianism. Yes. Lacan is a master, but he's flawed. He's limited. We have to go beyond him. Every master has to be go gone beyond in some sense for Beju. And of course, I had folks on my program from the Australian Bejuzian community, and they were like, oh, you like theory of the subject way too much. You don't see how basically being an event renders the text pretty much uh you know obsolete yeah obsolete yeah 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 so in my heart i've never really i've much more taken your position bruno on this on this debate and of course you could see anti-oedipus as also yes it develops all these concepts but it's also trying to say that lacanianism is too bourgeois in its own way and we need to go this way so it's like these two different paths yeah theory of the subject and anti-oedipus and of course, young people are always fond of saying, well, you know, the 68 romanticism and they were, Bajou was harassing Deleuze and all of this stuff. Um, could you talk a little bit about 
theory of the subject and um, anti-Oedipus, perhaps. And do you think that maybe, you know, they, they succeed in a way or what, how they succeed? And, and maybe um, maybe for, for listeners, you know, could they be read like um, uh, together in a way or how might they be read in tandem? Um, I'm not sure that people naturally think that those two texts can be read in tandem, but maybe they should be in a sense. Yeah, I think they should be, they can be, obviously not in, in our today's, you know, university discourse of schools and isms, where, you know, everybody is protecting their fiefdom and is scared about, you know, letting anybody step on their sensitive toes um and sort of bracketing off and and putting up gates and um enclosures around theoretical traditions that need to be uh saved and protected um but if we can break through that for a moment um and step back from the both the technical jargon the philosophical systems and look at the the orientations and the impulses and the the, the drives behind some of these projects. I mean, for one thing, I've always been struck that if people call themselves leftist or communist, they should also find common and communist um, impulses behind contemporary theory. So if we cannot even find the common agenda among these many communist orientations, that's kind of, you know, a pathetic definitive judgment of, on, on that would be a pathetic definitive judgment on the uselessness of whatever it is that we're or doing. Or even, even, even to say that Deleuze and Guattari are anti-Marxist, it's to yeah, me, it's, right. a, it's a absurdity to make such a claim. Uh, it's, it's foolish. Yeah. But, you know. Well, let's think, for example, about um, what I said before, that uh, Rotisner makes the argument at one point in the book on Freud that the hypothesis, a scientific myth uh, of uh, the killing of the primordial father has the same status as the notion of originary accumulation or primitive accumulation, in so-called accumulation in Marx. Well, if you look at the status of those sections, particularly the ones in um, right before and then in the section on uh, economic forms that precede capitalism in Marx's Grundrisse, um, I don't know if, if you remember, but uh, Etienne Balibar in his um, contribution to Reading Capital, uh, which is supposed to offer us elements of historical materialism. So this is where, you know, we should finally get kind of the Althusserian take on what the science of history would look like, kind of rejects that section and says, that's certainly not the, the section that we need to go and look at because that's kind of still, you know, pre, pre proper marks, right? Um, now those sections, those are obligatory readings for anybody doing Marxism in Latin America and in many other so-called peripheries. Why? Because you need to understand the, the, you know, the, the coming into being of capitalism, the violent process of the coming into being of capitalism at all levels. And that's why also um, uh, Rotisner insists, I, mean, I made a mistake by lapses with Foucault, because I also think that there's an interesting parallel between Foucault's sort of regressing in time and going back to ancient Hellenistic period in order to understand the history of sexuality and then history ultimately of, of subjectivity, as in the hermeneutics of subjectivity and his final seminars or uh, seminar lecture courses at the Collège de France. But Rotisner, um, by going back to Christianity, I think does something similar to what Deleuze and Guattari do in the book anti in, the, in the, the central chapter on savages, barbarians, and capitalists, right, or civilized, um, which is they attempt to offer in whatever rudimentary or axiomatic form a history of how historically uh, Oedipus is only possible at a certain moment in history. Now, that's a question that um, Badiou doesn't allow us to ask. He believes that that's a historicist question that takes, draws attention away from what alone matters, which would be the eternal trans-historical power of truths in the plural within certain worlds, but nonetheless 
you know, inherited and, and capable of resurrection in other worlds or other situations. Um, but I do think that somebody who more or less attempts to not claim themselves an, a, a respectable Marxist, but at least go in that direction as an orientation or as an impulse, again, um, without worrying too much about which criteria do I have to fulfill to be added and included into the club of the proper, you know, reading of Marxist capital or something. Um, but if you follow just a general tr uh, thrust of, of Marx's own investigations, you need to look at that. You need to look at the different historical forms that land ownership has taken, the different forms, collective forms of political organization have taken. This is, after all, what Marx started studying after, was studying at the end of his life. This is why he started learning Russian. This is why he read all the stuff about the Russian commune. This is why he read all the stuff about the Mexican uh, and the pre-Hispanic um, forms of la collective land ownership, because he felt that it was on, at, on that level of the sort of the, the revolutionary conjunction of, you know, marginally developed capitalism and the survival or persistence of communal forms of collective life, um, that revolution would break out. And lo and behold, he was right about that, both in the case of Russia and the case of Mexico. So I just wrote, uh, published a new book on, uh, on this notion of the commune in Mexico, um, which precisely argues in favor of understanding to what extent a book like anti oedipus or a thousand plateaus or a book like what is philosophy or being an event or theory of the subject or freud and limits of bourgeois individualism are elements or pieces of a much larger puzzle that we should not divvy up too quickly in terms of here is the philosophical here are the philosophical topics mostly debated in french english german or italian and their translations and here are sort of the historical empirical investigations that's good for mm -hmm. you know people in latin america to do their empirical research right mm. and therefore you're going to find that in discussions about history or anthropology mm -hmm. or ethnology mm -hmm. uh, or more empirically oriented political science while mm -hmm. the real theory what do people discuss in in altasarian circles from the gruntrisse mostly the introduction and then under the influence of the Italians, the fragmental machines, that's it. Nobody talks about those, those sections in the middle, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, yeah. you know, it seems, I don't know, outdated or anthropology is, is by definition an imperialist mm -hmm. linear theological discourse and therefore we shouldn't go that path. Mm -hmm. Well, it just so happens that Marx at the end of his life started reading Morgan and from the very culmination of the triadic structure that Deleuze and Guattari also adopt in Anti-Oedipus, mm -hmm. savagery, barbarism, and civilization, mm -hmm. Marx was able to somehow extract the logic whereby communism was going to be the return in superior condition of an archaic form of life that was communal or communist, mm -hmm. that in that sense was anything but so-called primitive communism. Mm -hmm. This was really the bedrock of us being able to think about these logics of subjectivity at the level of collective subjectivity, which is yeah. far beyond, let's say, the psychic life of affects or right. even the superego or ag aggressivity, but has mm -hmm. to do with those logics of, of revolt and, and, um, and reactionary um, uh, backlashes mm -hmm. that have defined the last five or six centuries of yeah. world history. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you saw this with Soviet Marxists and even with Ernst Bloch, which was really inspired by Engels's work on the peasant revolts, yes. which then would develop the notion of what we call invariance or a theory of invariance, which is, we were just talking about this with Lukács, which is Lukács's debate with Bloch on Unser was Lukács was saying, well, it's ultimately, what do we gain from studying these revolts of the middle ages? They're just spiritual, their interior, their kind of just uh, contemplative stance. They're, they don't transform the material relations. And Ernst Bloch was like, no, actually, that's not true. Like the, the whole motto of Munzer was everything is in common. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And um, 
Right. Yeah, but I, that, you see, the, the same text, the same uh, text and, and uh, example of Munzer also serves by you in his little book on uh, Dilidiologie, like on ideology. And that's exactly where he forms the, the notion of communist invariance. Yes. And he adds that, of course, the communist invariants are inscribed in historically specific forms. Um, they adopt very often a reactionary spiritual ideology, as in the case of Protestantism. But nonetheless, if they are being mobilized by a new historical agent, in this case, the peasants, the combination of that can be explosively revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, I would only add that we should retain from that not just the notion of the idea or the invariant, mm -hmm. or even worse, the one invariant, not even the invariant of the communist idea. Mm -hmm. But if that's really true, then we should also study the way in which those invariants are historically inscribed in different situations. And I think very often in the, among the readers of Badiou's work, uh, even those who are sympathetic to the notion of a communist invariant or a communist invariance in the plural, um, there is very little effort in, um, in, in doing that kind of historical work. That's yeah. what I would call the, the work of historical materialism. Um, when I, you know, told Badiou about this, um, he either would invoke all the passages, including in Logics of Worlds, for example, where he talked, begins and ends with Maoism, mm -hmm in part because I had asked him about why can't you bring back this whole background of your own Maoism that no reader of being an event understands if they just take being an event. Nobody understands that this is a kind of a, a synthesis that comes out of the experience of historical Maoism in France. Mm -hmm. And said, oh yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe I should sort of give back the historical adherences of the concept, he said. Um, and that's what he does in Logics of Worlds, which mm -hmm. begins and ends with Maoism it's still not exactly the same as doing the actual work of historical analysis. You yeah. see, we're back to what I was saying before about the Lacanians who look at specific events as illustrations of the Lacanian concepts, such as the right. real or a death drive, which right. then appears illustrated in a movie or in a, in a, in right. a social revolt or in a riot or in a, in an electoral crisis. Yeah. But it is not being studied in its own imminent inscription within a certain situation. Mm -hmm. It is only, it is the illustration of an invariant uh, structural conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where, it's not a question of supplementing by you, but of, of adding an angle at, or strengthening a dimension that is certainly present. Mm -hmm. Logically, it is supposed to be the case. And this is why I keep insisting on the importance of theory, the subject as the real core of all of Badiou's thinking, which is that there is no... Um, event, or rather, let's put it a different way. If deconstruction somehow assumes that there is difference, right? Il y a de la différence, as, as Derrida writes in, in the postcard. And you can't say more than that, right? Even his reading of the present principle is, you know, there's, there's two principles plus one, which is never turned into a third principle. There's just the rhythmic play of difference between the, the reality principle and the, pre the pre pleasure principle. But there is an, a sort of an assumption in deconstruction that there are a porous, there are inconsistencies. What you earlier called, an, there's an antinomian foundation of the way we think system about, about systems or structures in any realm, whether it's a literary work or it's, or it's the social, right? There is no social society or there is no sexual relationship. It assumes that there is this given of the real of, of a certain impossibility. I think Badiou's major intervention in being an event based on theory of the subject is to say, there is no such a poria or impasse visible or tangible unless there is already a subjective process that mm. is initiated at some point. In other mm. words, you can offer a deconstruction of the structure of the one, which is how he describes it. He uses that expression at the early on in the book of being an event. So yes, he, he belongs to a post-metaphysical tradition if you want, because he, he offers you a deconstruction of, of substance, which is not one, but mul multiple. You can only assert that retroactively based on the impasses or the sort of the dead end streets to which these mathematical, you know, formalizations lead you. Mm 
but that's not a given mm. to which you can refer structurally as always already there in the way that the Ridians assume. Mm. It, it is only possible mm. if there historically is, or, is already a subjective process that is intervening, mm. which is what he calls in a, in a brilliant formula, which for me sums up being an event and also suggests why Badius ontology and deconstruction of the one is inseparable from his theory of the subject, which is the excess of being, you know, which makes being sort of err uh, beyond control between the situation and the state of the situation. So again, the excess of being, the, the impasse of being, which is revealed in the mathematical meditations of being an event, is at the same time the pass of the subject. L'impasse de l'être, you know, dot, 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 est en même temps la passe du sujet. Mm. Mm. This is where you have this articulation between the impasse of a given structure and the pass, the passing, the passage of a subject. You do not have one without the other. This, mm. for me, is the new L Lacanian Althusserian synthesis to think mm. together the truth not only of substance, but also of subject. That is to say, not only as a substance that is now shown to be structurally incomplete because of the systematic deadlocks, but those deadlocks or impasses are not visible unless there is, we already have an event that allows the subject and that is it working on those impasses. Mm -hmm. So we don't have simply a structural notion of the event. We have a... A notion of an event that is inseparable from a subjective intervention and then once the further step which Badiou does not take those interventions can and should be historicized mm -hmm. without losing any of the force of the interventions in my view as is the claim when people argue that doing mm -hmm. such historical investigation leads to historicism mm -hmm. that that sort of you know as, as Badiou says at one point in the interview that I, one of the interviews that I did with him, Foucault is great, but what's amazing is Foucault ultimately is a historicist who gives you an 18th century without anything that would be what, what I would consider the event, right? It's like a 18th century without French Revolution, without yeah. Rousseau, and so on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. the historicist has, has, has evacuated the events from the structures of epistemic consistency. Yeah, and, I mean, that's really I, nice. Yeah, it's really nice because, I mean, even Lazarus in the notion of saturation, I think, gives us more of a um, framework for doing that Bajusian historical periodization. Because, like, you know, it's, for example, if 1917 is this maximalist um, event, well, how do we then understand and, and um, inquire into the efficacy or lack of efficacy of its visibility in our world. Well, exactly. right? that's exactly what Lazarus uh, develops under the notion of the worker's inquiry. Right. So you, the worker's inquiry is like, is Leninism dead or alive, right? Uh, but that also, it, that yeah. also su supposes or, or suggests that Leninism, as Lazarus says, is a historical mode of doing politics. Right. And you need to understand the sequences during which they, those are vital forms of doing politics. And they, re they reach a point of exhaustion or saturation. Yeah. They, they are operative under a certain number of watchwords and in a certain number of places or, mm -hmm. or sites. Mm -hmm. um, just like I think, and Badiou says this himself, there's different sequences to the communist idea. I think that is still the most productive part of his yeah. of his argument in yeah. favor of yeah. a return to communism there are sequences of the communist idea that means right. there are historical moments or to use a Ronsarian term or modes to use Lazarus's term of doing politics and that means we do not just have one form of the political event that would That's be right. valid for all times from Plato till today that's right because they Lazarus and Bedju are fond of quoting that letter that Marx wrote to the um, general uh, that fought in the Civil War, who was an, a 48er, uh, I forget his name, but you know, it's the point where uh, the general who was sympathetic to Marx says, what is your most important, basically conceptual invention is, 
uh, it's not that class struggle is some eternal thing. He says, no, the bourgeois scientists discover that. It's rather that there's a kind of historical periodicity to the class struggle. And that actually, maybe you could say, Bruno, I wonder if you agree, is a way in which Badiou actually, why did Badiou say, okay, I'm no longer committed to the party in, the, in that moment? He makes an interesting reference in the Can Politics Be Thought, where he was actually investigating what was happening in certain political uprisings. Um, I'm thinking here of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, for example. And he was recognizing that something like the Leninist Party has exhausted itself. That's a tragic uh, reality. I think we have this debate today, like, you know, people call themselves Stalinist today. To me, it's like, what are you doing, right? Like, uh, with it. so like, Bajou is somebody who takes quite seriously these historical uh, oscillations, you know? of, of, of uh, the class struggle. I wonder, I wonder if you agree with that framework or what would you say? Yeah, I mean, those, those are all moments that I, I, I would stress more than, let's say, the, the impulse to systematize um, but use on, on thinking, right? Which is also one of the reasons why I was so taken by, by theory of the subject when I first read it. Right? Because it was a sort of a, an open-ended, wild, crazy, innovative. Um, I mean, I don't like you know the the bland invocation of singularity, but it is definitely a singular book. I mean, for once, it might be worth using that term because it's it's almost written like without any concern whatsoever for the reader being able to make sense of it. But that's also why you can sort of take so many parts of this and take it in different directions that are not quite yet but use philosophical system, even though everything from being an event is already present in theory of the subject. I mean, all the mathematics is there. Uh, much of the readings of Rousseau and, and Mallarmé and um, is also there, maybe not the more classical or neoclassical philosophical meditations, um, but pretty much everything else is there, except mm -hmm. that it's not yet rounded up like a philosophical system that presents itself under the arch classical title of being an event, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. just the very structure of that of that title. I mean, he, he concludes has, he concludes being an event part one with a return to theory of the subject, right? As an exactly. unfinished, and, and in a way he concludes being an event and part it, two and with and the same. It begins, and it begins and ends. Uh, always exactly. a return to the to that one. So there is an allergy amongst Bajusian scholars today to deny your position. I feel like you've, you've been kind of uh, holding the line for a while now <laughs> on this. It's, uh, it's a good position to hold. I mean, I have so much sympathy with it, honestly. And we're actually about to do a big reading um, with the New English Translation of Eminence of Truth, Part 3. Um, you're more than welcome to hop in on that at any time. Um, but I, we're reaching about an hour and a half, Bruno, and um, sure. I want to respect your time. This has been a fabulous uh, conversation. Um, I always like to conclude my interviews with just a question regarding what you are working on at the moment you want to share with us um well um so i wrote it i just finished this in uh, last summer i finished this book on the mexican commune uh i actually was in the middle of trying to finish a book that's been promised for a long time and that my editor uh sebastian budgen has been uh -huh. haunting and haunting me about um just philosophies of defeat the jargon yeah. of finitude yes we so that's wait. a that's a polemic with uh, post Heideggerians, mainly Derrida, La Coulabart, Jean Luc Nancy, and, Nancy, and George yeah. Agamben. Uh -huh. um, sort of a dark book. It's um, it's a book of uh, about how a certain philosophy, which has become very dominant and which has been, in a sense, also incorporated in in the Althusserians' work, and you know, whatever you you need to go through a certain deconstruction of a form of essentialism, which Laclau and Zizek and, 
Judith Butler and everybody else has had to go through, they participate to some extent in that same trend. So I'm trying to hopefully finish this in the next few weeks, if not months. Um, yeah, we need I'm writing that. a, a um, an, uh, uh, bringing out a new set of essays on more Latin American Marxism to sort of mm -hmm. continue with the book on Marx and Freud in Latin America. This is called mm -hmm. The State and Insurrection. Mm -hmm. um, so just sort of revisiting a number of key concepts from a certain mostly Marxist tradition, but not only Marxist, like uneven development or the, the critique of violence that I talked about before, mm -hmm. um, or debates about um, uh, dual power or... Uh, and so trying to, by revisiting those concepts, to, to understand how we have come to our present impasse, which I think can best be defined by the complete diametrical opposition between state and insurrection, whereby state insurrection can be either right wing or, or, or left wing. There's a shared imaginary of, of insurrection because of the complete exhaustion of parliamentary, electoral, mm -hmm. democratic, mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. decision making. Mm -hmm. um, it, it probably has not led to an enrichment of our understanding and theory of the state, unlike what happened in the 60s and 70s when people were trying to really finesse the understanding of state and state apparatuses. So I think that's a drawback of this. Um, I think it also has led to a complete um, uh, deadlock in any activist or militant forms of politics, in part, because many of the theoretical debates have incorporated that tradition that I call you know, the, the philosophy or philosophies of defeat, which I also mm. believe are actively mm. defeatist in, in uh, making it impossible to um, even defend um, an alternative form of, of um, political subjectivation. Right? Mm -hmm. And then on the larger scale, a long-term project is precisely to keep on doing what I was mentioning a little bit in terms of um, the influence still for me of Adiusti or the subject. So I see a lot of what I do as an, an attempt to not to uh, pluralize or simply offer an, an eclectic plurality of different theories of the subject. Mm -hmm. But I do want to understand not just the theory of the subject axiomatically or structurally, like what's the structural theory of the operations of, of a subject also in the way that Judith Butler in The Psychic Life of Power talks about it, or the way that Zizek in most of his writings talks about it, or the way that like Kalau and others in Latin America have talked about it, but also this question about the history of the subject. Mm -hmm. Because if one is a Marxist um, or one is a materialist, um, it's hard to swallow the notion that we have one concept or theory of the subject that's identical from Plato until today. <laughs> we would assume that there have been some major turning points, such as, you know, the one that defines our our calendar in, in the West, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is why Rochesner turned to Christianity. I understand mm -hmm. the subjective logic of Christianity with through a, a close analysis of the confessions. Mm -hmm. But there are many others. Obviously, as a Marxist, the rights and, and the origins, the violent origins of capitalism and, and its understanding, mm -hmm. or Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Mm -hmm. Um, or, um, you know, the mm -hmm. civil war, if more locally, of course, there's a number of thresholds and turning points that we could focus on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. For me, as a Latin Americanist, first and foremost, the conquest and colonization of the new world, yeah. including the legacies of, um, uh, uh, you know, genocide and slavery, yeah. um, are inseparable from the very understanding of, uh, of capitalism and therefore yeah. also you know, in, in fairly easily understandable terms, explain, you know, the contemporary persistence of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm interested in this notion of the history of the subject. Yeah. I or think rather, the history of, of, of why there is one fear of the subject that has become accepted as the only one, which is mostly one based on the philosophical tradition of German, German idealism. With a few exceptions, of course, people who want to avoid that, they usually turn to pre-Kantian materialists, right? Mm. Spino for some, that's Spinoza. For others, it means Lucretius um, or ancient atomism. Mm. So as to think, 
an, a, a, a notion of substance or atoms or immanence of, of being that would not bother with Kantian and Hegelian or post-Hegelian notions of subjectivity. So that's the longer term project is to write something like theories of the subject. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, even Bedju hints at this notion of, okay, if the condition of politics is organized around uh, the affirmation or the elevation of equality, the name of equality, and it takes different forms. And he does a nice job in just precisely through the notion of resurrection of like, okay, Spartacus slave revolt, 1804 in Haiti, uh, Spartacist uprising with Luxembourg, right? Like this beautiful thing. It's yeah. interesting though, that so much more can be done in those kinds of, you know, so many more PhD dissertations could be written with a Bejusian uh, notion of historical periodization to look at the affective dimension of the revolts and the kind of, because Bedju just gives you just a little, little hint, but not many people have followed him through uh, enough on that, in that regard. Are you doing anything with Bedju's Nietzsche in terms of translation? Yeah, so I'm. I, I I have finished the translation. I uh, I am sort of behind in 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 sending it off with an introduction. So that's all that needs to be done. Still, I need to write a little, a little preface, which I've promised, um, and it should be done shortly. Beautiful. Which I yeah. think is a is a great seminar. I mean, I'm not necessarily all that um, enthusiastic about the prospect of Badusian dissertations. Um, I really think that that kind of work will definitely require that people read more history books and, and books of anthropology and the, the, the empirical politics within the situations that they're interested in. Sure. Because otherwise, we're only going to get applied Badu, right? Which is right. no better or no worse than applied Lacanianism, right. where every you know new event is sort of squeezed back into a perfect <laughs> illustration of the real or death right. 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 Um, so, and you've um, seen that with the malarians. They like to do a history of the big other, right? This kind of is a topic. Uh, right. But it's, it's from the standpoint of the static concept always, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit torn in that sense. Like, um, it's also strange, I think, that some of the, you know, I'm not sure if we're like the old Badusians, like Peter Howard and Alberto Toscano and Nina Power mm -hmm. and myself. Um, we sort of all of, you know, moved away a little bit from, from, mm -hmm. I think in part because it, to resist that centripetal force of the, of the system, right? I think it's very hard to do. And I, and, and I'm, I'm undecided or not, not a hundred percent clear about what I think about that. But so my work is, you don't you don't want to facilitate or encourage the the, the industry of Bajuian that, that because you, we see the dangers that comes with this kind of uh, thing yeah that yeah and and yeah exactly and so it, it is a little bit of a i'm just like the heideggerians and the deridians and mm -hmm. you know have their own in, and lacanians everybody has their industry you know mm -hmm. mostly of course also centripetal with the focus in western europe mm -hmm. And I am very reluctant to mm. continue, you know, fostering or facilitating that path if it makes it so that people will continue to read first the latest translation of an Italian or a French philosopher before right. reading up something about the history of, of an African or a Latin American or an Asian political movement. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book right now on Nietzsche. Um, influenced by um, Domenico Losurdo as well as Lukács' reading of Nietzsche, which has kind of been forgotten because Frankfurt School erased Lukács' critique of Nietzsche. But it's very interesting sure. that when Bedjou writes on Nietzsche, you'll notice that in his polemics with Ranciere, there's this notion of egalitarian, arist aristocratic egalitarianism. And Bedjou says straight out, Nietzsche is a political thinker, he has he, the heart of Nietzsche is politics, which is a good admission because most left Nietzscheans don't say that at all. They say he's an aesthetic, a political thinker. So I actually have found, and Alenka Zupanchik has a nice book on Nietzsche, which is basically, she's relying on Bedju mostly because she sure. read the seminars. Sure. But I like, I like Bedju's uh, Nietzsche. Uh, however, at some point in the future, I'd love to chat with you more about this aristocratic business. And, uh, 
because you know he gets it from Plato, and basically Bajou wants to say something along the lines that you do need an egalitarian. Um, I mean, I love the fact that Bajou recenters equality, and even Losurdo in his book on Occidental Marxism criticizes Bajou as basically being bourgeois for talking so much about equality. And to me, there's nothing worse than a Marxist that's against equality these days. Uh, that's a whole other thing. But um, what do you make of, of, this is my final question, of Bajou's Nietzsche? Do you, do you think that he kind of gives us something interesting to work with? Are you kind of convinced of what he does with, with Nietzsche in, 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 a, in those seminars? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, um, one of the reasons why I, I propose to, to translate it is that I think it's one of the most touching and um, moving seminars that Badiou has done in the sense that he really, not just superficially or rhetorically, tries to stay as long and as closely to Nietzsche as possible. But, but because you can really see how he moved from kind of a knee-jerk, as he says in the beginning, a knee-jerk anti-Nietzscheanism uh, under the influence of sort of his anti-Delusianism and his anti-movementism mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. late 60s and early 70s, and his resistance to sort of go that libidinal route of, mm -hmm. of, um, of the, the Freud of Marxists and the mm -hmm. Deleuze and Guattari, um, that from this knee-jerk anti-Nietzscheanism, he became really somebody who almost merges with Nietzsche's thought to an extreme extent, right? And that would also suggest that there is something, there's an anti-philosophical impulse in Badiou himself, which is mm. an argument that I, I've made elsewhere. Um, you know, why is it that Badiou is so fascinated by all these anti-philosophers, even though technically, according to his own parameters, this is in a sense, it's better than the sophists, but it's still uh, a threat that he wants to keep at bay, right? So in a, in a strictly Platonist fashion, he aims his anger and rage, his tumults against the uh, anti-philosophers, who he believes to be the most interesting interlocutors that uh, a philosopher today has to go through. Um, but the reasons for why he ultimately rejects the anti-philosophers in a nutshell, because they kind of believe in the possibility that what they're doing is in and of itself an act, mm -hmm. so that philosophy itself would be capable of producing an event, which is something that for Badiou philosophy cannot. Right. But what I would suggest is that if there is an anti-philosophical impulse, which is what explains the love that Badiou ha has started to feel for Nietzsche in that seminar, which you can mm. sense on every page, mm. which is beautifully, you know, exemplary kind of way of engaging with a thinker with whom one does not agree. Mm. I would mm. say the same, by the way, uh, uh, about his book on Deleuze, even though this is mm. utterly and, and completely unacceptable for all Deleuzeans. I still think this is an incredibly respectful and worthy, and in my view, correct. Uh, uh, but of course, people will say, yeah, you'll say it's correct because you're a Badiou and you don't understand anything about the Leuze. But I still think that Badiou is onto something, even in, in terms of uh, the Leuze's own terms, particularly in early works like Logics of Sense. Um, but what the reason, in other words, why Badiou is so drawn to Nietzsche and shows his love on every page of the Nietzsche seminar is that there is fundamentally also a tempt, an anti-philosophical temptation within Badiou himself. How does that it, appear? What, where does that? Where does this? Where does it? For example, when when people on blurbs on the back of, of Badiou's book say, "This is a, the Badiou event," or "X and so and Y show us that there is such a thing as a Badiou event." Now, this is obviously pure nonsense, right? <laughs> Right, because there is no event. Philosophy never produces an event. So right. unless you say, but you as a political organizer produces an event, which is mm. much more questionable. Mm. This notion that there are events within philosophy, which a Heideggerian would have no problem uh, uh, su suggesting, but a Badiouian should never suggest. Mm. The reason why I think Badiou is happy to go along with those statements is because it does suggest that there is kind of a break, mm. and there is a before and an after Alain Badiou in philosophy. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that there is such a thing as uh, the capacity 
for a philosopher to open up an event. Now, for Badiou, in his, according to the terms of his Nietzsche seminar, that's a sign of madness. If a philosopher believes that they are capable of producing an event, they are mad, as Nietzsche was. This would define, this would be the philosophical definition of madness in Nietzsche. Mm. Nietzsche falls into his own trap when he believes that he himself is the overman and the announcement or prophecy through Zarathustra of a future overman for which we will have to wait 2,000 years and you know so many meters mm. Mm. above the sea level. Mm. I think there is a small but nonetheless significant anti-philosophical tendency in Badiou himself, which I also would call kind of a speculative leftism in Badiou, which is a tendency he fights against constantly, which is why every time there is a book that seems to fortify sort of this radical, absolutist, disjointed understanding of the miraculous event, mm. he has he knows that he needs to go back to, in, to articulate its inscription within a world. So after being an event, which is his most speculative leftist book, anti-dialectical book, even though I use the term dialectics nonstop, but he's sort of in the sway, under the sway of Lazarus and others. And, you know, at the moment when they believe we need to abandon all dialectical articulations between the objective and the subjective, we need to think truth only at the pure self-authorized subjective level. After being an event, he feels the need to then reinscribe and say, oh, but truths have to be inscribed within a situation, which I'm going to call a world. Mm. And as though that was not enough, suddenly it appears there's a third volume necessary, just called the imminence of truth, as though... Even in Logics of Worlds, he had too transcendent an understanding of truth. So in Imminence of Worlds, he needs to have a methodical understanding of how we can project or plonger, how we can have kind of um, an inscription of the absoluteness of a truth within the imminence of a situation. So mm. you see, this is Badiou himself working against his own leftist tendencies or mm. ultra-leftist tendencies. So if we believe that the inscription of, a, of an event within a situation is what risks flattening it out into kind of a Foucauldian historicism devoid of any events. But you himself counters that with a, an ultra leftist inscription of the radicality of absolute events as complete breaks. And then non constantly insist, oh, but there are no absolute beginnings. There are no heroes of the events. This is always within the inscription and fidelity from within the symptomatic site. Mm. But then most readers, of course, forget about the site, they forget about mm. torsion, and they only keep the dualism of, situ of, mm. of, of being an event. And then there's nothing left except sort of dogmatic and enthusiasm and fidelity to the event as such without any organization or inscription. Hence, what he says, the coup de barre de droite, the sort of the reaction back towards a more right orient rightist orientation of seeing how truths are inscribed, Mm. Not just transcendent, absolute truths, um, if you want, above the, this world, but part of the world, mm. right? And so yeah, that's, that's why yeah, that's, I think that's, the, the Nietzsche seminar is so, is so fascinating, yeah. because that's but, where Badiou is struggling with that. I like that. I like that. But I would just say one comment, which is, isn't it also true that in that seminar, he's also saying that Nietzsche's contribution to philosophy also has to be understood in Badiouian sense in the, through the condition of politics, right? Like, so philosophy and politics, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, is not only to be understood as some kind of madman who performs a uh, self-declarative event and the, the, through the speech, which Alenka Zupanchik loves to make that point. No, also he calls it the arc political event of Nietzsche. Yeah. And I, I love that uh, emphasis there. And um but I, I actually think that there's another way to read Nietzsche for Marxism today, which is like a much more kind of active a, a, an active uh, sort of pugilistic uh, polemical way of reading Nietzsche, because we now have all of this research about how Nietzsche talked about socialism and communism, which was like extraordinarily robust in not a, even a reactionary way, but in like a highly sophisticated way, which was adopted by liberals, by reactionaries, and by fascists. And so Nietzsche's politics were like really sophisticated and we benefit from understanding this kind of, uh, it, its influence, I guess you could say, is that's my kind of position, but then I'm, but Badiou complicates that picture for me. Um, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, that again, it would be, it would be fascinating um, to see uh, a debate or uh, 
a conjunction between Los Surdos, yes. um, Nietzsche, and, yes. and what? So they claim, Los Surdos claim that Nietzsche is fundamentally responding to the Paris Commune. Correct. Communism. Correct. And Badiou's maybe slightly more distant from the facts, uh, right. claim that Nietzsche is fundamentally mimicking the French Revolution could be put you, into a very you, productive yeah. dialogue. Uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to do, because in a way, Nietzsche not only is just a reactionary that can be thought of along like Gustave Le Bon, who we spoke about and other reactionaries, and he's just one. No, Losurdo's point is that is an arc reactionary who is like, you could say the six, the successful figure who shuts down the emancipatory uh, genie that came out of the French Revolution, Nietzsche. Nietzsche stands at the precipice of the of the successful suppression of it, right? He kills Jacobinism. Jacobinism is Socratism for Nietzsche. He kills Socrates. He kills this uh, God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, that's Losurdo's position. I would love to see what Badiou thinks of that. Yeah. You know? I, I, yeah. I totally agree with you. All right. Um, Bruno, all the best, comrade. Really fun. Thank you okay. so much. All right. Have a Thanks great weekend. So much. Okay, you we'll, too. We'll be in touch. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye, everybody.